everybody. We are continuing our study in the book of Ezekiel. If you recollect, we have completed chapter 28, and today we are starting with chapter 29. Kindly turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 29. Let me read the first verse. In the 10th year, in the 10th month, on the 12th of the month, the word of the Lord came to me saying, God speaks to Ezekiel in the 10th year. He is counting the 10th year from the captivity of the Israelite king. We have seen it in the first chapter. 10th month and 12th month. Shall you look to the Lord in prayer? Loving Heavenly Father, we say thank you to you for the time you have given to us that we as your children can gather together, meditate upon your word, and then bring our supplications to you, Lord. We pray that you will bless our time together. We pray, Lord, that you will speak to us even as we look into Ezekiel chapter 29. We pray, Lord, that even as you are pronouncing judgments upon the nation surrounding Israel, we may understand who you are, the God Almighty creator of heaven and earth, and what you require from humanity. To this end, Lord, open our understanding, guide us in the study of your word. Committing the study into your hands, we offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we have been looking at Ezekiel, and Ezekiel has been pronouncing a lot of judgments against Judah, against Israel, against Jerusalem. They are the people of God. The promised land God gave to Abraham, the city of God, Jerusalem, he pronounced judgment on all of them. Then he moves on to the neighboring countries. He talked about Ammon. He talked about Moab. He talked about Edom. He talked about Tyre. He pronounced judgment upon all of them. So the idea is we need to understand why God is pronouncing judgment upon his own people as well as those who are not his people whom we call as Gentiles, who don't believe in the Lord God. They are their own gods and idol worship. And today we are going to look at the judgment which God is pronouncing against Egypt. Now pause for a moment. When we talk about Egypt, we need to understand certain things about Egypt. Sometimes it doesn't uh, come to our mind fully. Okay, that's how we are going to study in chapter 29. Now, as we study also, as usual, at the end of it, there will be some time, kindly feel free to express your opinion. Okay, you may have some idea, some opinion, or some questions. There will be time for that before we go in for prayer. Having said that, Egypt, what comes to your mind when you think of Egypt? Tourists who go to Egypt even today, what are they looking for? the pyramids of Egypt. Have you ever considered how they were built? Limestone and granite stones, some of them weighing 40 tons. Is it possible to build a monument like that with modern equipment? How many countries in the world can afford to do that? Think about it. The Egyptians did it. Hundreds of years before Christ was born. That is the marvel of the Egyptian dynasty. You remember the pharaohs were there? And we see the exodus, Moses meeting the pharaoh. Moses was brought up in one of those royal houses. And these Egyptians did it many, many years back. So technologically, politically, and scientifically, why I'm saying scientifically, if when you look at a pyramid, what marvels everybody's sites are equal. And the orientation is same. How do you do that they are wondering? With what equipment they did it? So they were advanced very scientifically. And if you look at a pyramid, it's not the outer structure. Inside there is a place for the pharaoh to live. They thought the pharaoh will be after life, after death. They thought pharaoh is living there. And they built it. Amazing. And they were able to put golden vessels inside the pyramid. They were all stolen later on. Things went and stolen. 
think of all this. And the entrance was kept secret. And if you study that, that is a technology they had. And against that country, God is pronouncing his judgment. From a lofty level in which the Egypt was running, God points his finger at them because of all these things, I'm going to make you a low level kingdom. That's the first thing it says. Second thing is, if you look at his own children, Israelites, when they sinned, God said, I'm going to scatter you around the world. And the same God said, I will gather you back. He said it his own people. Apart from his own people, he says the same similar prophecy to the Egyptians. It's the only country, God says, I'm going to scatter you and I'm going to gather you back into your land. No other country has got that kind of a promise. Let's go dwell now into chapter 29. So the date is given. When you look into chapter 29, Ezekiel talks verse 1 to verse 16 in this particular date given in verse 1. Verse 17 onwards, there's a different date. So as we go through that, we'll see how many years afterwards he talks from verse 17. Let's start with verse 1. It says, 10th year, 10th month, 12th day. 10th year, 10th month, 12th day. That's the starting point. Verse 2. Shall we read verse 2, please? Son of man, set your face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Prophecy against him, against all Egypt. Now, God understands how Egypt was ruled. Egypt was ruled by a pharaoh. And the people of Egypt followed pharaoh all that he said. Literally some of them were treating him as a demigod. What pharaoh said, that's it. It'll happen. So that's why he said pharaoh and his people. That's what he says in everybody in Egypt. They are going to face this. The judgment is coming to the ruler as well as to the people who followed the ruler. So keep that in mind. That's a big principle God says. Don't blindly follow a human ruler. That's the point God says. Don't blindly follow a human ruler. Why? Today, after Pentecost, what God has done? You don't need to follow a human ruler. I will. He promised it and he has done it after Pentecost. I will seal you with the promise of the Holy Spirit. And Romans chapter 8, Paul is telling that as many as are led by the Spirit of God, he says. That is the point we need to know. God has got a direct touch with every one of his people. That is what God had in his mind for humanity, even when he created the man and woman in the Garden of Eden. But over time, everything changed. They wanted kings. They wanted this political system, that political system. They went for idol worship. But God is bringing everything back to his own plan after Pentecost. Let's go on. Chapter 29 and verse 3. Let's read verse 3. Speak and say, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am against you, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, the great monster that lies in the midst of his rivers that said, My Nile is mine, I myself have made it. Now, what is God telling? The pharaohs, you know, they were having the river Nile. No problem of water. The Egypt has got a plenty of water because of the river Nile. And in the river Nile, do you remember Aswan Dam? Have you ever thought of it? Aswan Dam. So when I was in the school and colleges, the Russians were building the Aswan Dam. And if you, if you realize that, all these things, Aswan Dam is a great dam. And they, they, they had, it is cutting across the River Nile. And it's, it's such a big dam, you know. And that dam has created a lake, which was already a natural lake. 
It is 298 miles in width, the uh, length, 9.9 miles in width. That's the water. That much water, they got it. And the dam itself is two miles across. Okay, the Russians built it, modern dam. Think of it, olden days. When the population was less, enough water they had it. So they were proud of the river Nile. And to that extent, Ferris says, the river is my own. And he went on to say that, because they, they looked at Pharaoh as a god, I made it. He said, I made it. It belongs to me. Now, another thing is, the river Nile has got the river creatures. One, the one strongest creature in the rivers, apart from any fishes, is crocodile. So the crocodile was so strong, man cannot fight. The Egyptians could not fight the crocodile. So the Pharaoh used to compare himself, hey, look, I'm a crocodile. I'll just swallow anybody. So that is what he says here. It's the great monster that lies in the river. You call yourself a great monster like the crocodile? Look, I'm the creator. I'll tell you what I'm going to do with you. Let's go on to verse 4. I will put hooks in your jaws. Make the fish of your rivers to cling to your scales. I will bring you up out of the midst of the rivers and all the fish of your rivers will cling to your scale. He's talking about a crocodile. He said, I'm going to put a hook in your mouth, pull you out to the land. As you come out to the land, the fish will stick to your scale. In other words, what God says is, Pharaoh and the population of Egypt. He's referring to the population as the fish. That's all. So I'm going to handle Pharaoh and all those who follow Pharaoh, many of them, considering him to be a sort of a demigod, so whatever he says will happen, I am going to deal with them. Let's move on to verse 5. I will abandon you to the wilderness, you and all the fish of your rivers. You will fall on the open field. You will not be brought together or gathered. I have given you food to be the beast of the earth and birds of the sky. What he says is, Egypt, you must see the Egyptian kingdom under the pharaohs, when they were building the premise one after another, it was at the zenith. A kingdom which nobody can fight with or conquer. They were ruling the Egyptian kingdom. God says, I'm going to bring you down. And he will be thrown on an open field. He will be food for the beast. The other kingdoms will come, encroach you, and take your wealth. God pronounced it. It did happen historically. Let's move on to verse 6, please. In verse 6 says, Then all the inhabitants of Egypt will know that I am the Lord. What is the reason? You see, when God brings a judgment, Primarily, it is not for punishment. We need to understand the judgment of God pronounced in the Bible and the white throne judgment. The white throne judgment is the final punishment and the destiny of the people, which is to either you be with the Lord Jesus Christ and Him, the Lord God Himself, or you go to the lake of fire. That is the final judgment. Whereas the, all of the judgments which are written here, or for one purpose, this judgment brings sort of difficulties, trials, and you, you are either conquered, you are scattered, you don't have enough food, all these things. You go through a sort of a physical torture. For what? You will know that I am the Lord. The idea is, God says, you need to realize I am God. The two ways God does it is, in the Bible is, first he blesses. He says, you must acknowledge who is blessing you. If you acknowledge me, fine. Abraham acknowledged, he remained a blessed person. Then next, when they don't acknowledge, like the Egyptians and other things, he blessed them. Look at the way the Pharaohs were blessed by God. He allowed them to, to that extent. He said, you do not acknowledge me, so I'm going to do something else. I'm going to reverse it. You will go through trials, tribulation, difficulties, so that you will know that I'm the Lord God. There's a God in heaven and earth. 
that is only reason god is bringing trials difficulties famines pestilences you name it to people we think of a covid you know a lot of people die if somebody asks the question why does god allow it one answer that they may know mankind will know there's one god creator of heaven and earth that's it let's move on let's move on to the next verse verse 7 when they took hold of you with the hand you broke and tore all their hands when they leaned on you you broke and made all their loins quake now what is he talking about he's talking about one of the things the egyptian did the first thing is egyptians were claiming everything was awesome. they literally made themselves a demi god second problem god is pointing out is look there is a nation by name israel they looked to egypt for a support when their enemies were attacking them egypt came the pharaoh came with his army but in the midway he just left and went off that's what he says he left off they leaned on you you were not faithful to them so when israel trusted you you broke away from them now we read that all the kings and chronicles you see that the, one of the kings asked the pharaoh to come he comes and he walks away so israel is again plundered god says you cannot do that now pass for a moment what's the problem in god says he tells pharaoh and the egyptians you gave your word to israel that you will stand by him till the end you broke your word so god is watching all of us we can't even give a word even to believer or unbeliever it makes no difference if you give your word i'm going to do it you have to do it you can't break it god says you gave a word your word you are my child how can you break it now pharaoh is not following god even to him he says that so from this when you see the judgment we need to see what are the areas god is getting affected what are the areas god feels strongly to bring judgment upon people we need to understand that apply to our own life right first thing god says be humble everything comes from my hand if you have enough water like nai thank me for that i give you the water you do not make it they didn't do that second what did they do when israel wanted it they said yes they didn't do it they broke the promise let's keep going let's go to the next verse please verse 8 therefore thus says the lord i will bring upon you a sword i will cut off man and beast now you need to understand when god says that can anyone raise the sword against the egyptians impossible but god said it i am going to do that and he did it he raised the babylonians they came right across babylonians came if you see the map babylonians come to israel after israel they go to negev after that straight to sinai peninsula straight to river nile and egypt they went right up to egypt they were so powerful authority egypt was subdued at that time completely subdued god said it and it happened amazing these are things you know god's word is always true okay now let's move on to the next verse and the land of egypt will become a desolation and a waste they will know that i am the lord because you said the nile is mine i made it you got it the nile river nile even today flows but they have a problem with ethiopia they are fighting everything that is why if you claim your soul to be god and say that i made it the nile is mine and all these things i put a big dam even now they say they put a big dam even they have that kind of a water the nazar lake is there what is the economic level of the egyptians today think of it it happened many years back same thing they came down in their prosperity god said it 
he brought it so we need to understand one thing very important it is the blessing of the lord god even to the heathens even to the idol worshipers he allows it waiting for some time that they will acknowledge the goodness of the living god amazing now here in verse 10 if you look at it let's read verse 10 it talks about the boundaries of ethiopian sand he says therefore behold i am against you against your rivers i will make a land of egypt utter waste and desolation from migdal to sian even to the borders of ethiopia sian s y e n e sian is the place the aswan dam is built there is a tower egypt a uh, russian peace friendship tower sian that's the tower of sian <laughs> very interesting what uh, ezekiel is talking about sian is all out there you know you can relate it to the egypt even today so now let's go further let's go for this said i'm going to make the land of egypt desolate he said that okay now if you go to the next one verse 11 let's read verse 11 no man's foot will a man's foot will not pass through it and the foot of the beast will not pass through it it will not be inhabited for 40 years now this is something we need to understand 40 years it won't be inhabited it will be a short period for as israelites will give a long period he is bringing them back again in the next verse the babylonians came removed them and at that time the egyptians fled to many nations just like israelites did it they ran away from the babylonians their marauding armies and roughly about 40 years went on then cyrus you know was cyrus the persian took over the babylon when cyrus took over he told the people of the nations if you remember very correctly not only israel go back to your land build your cyrus was a very generous emperor he said go back to so israelites came back israel and they all came back no remember they built israel egyptians also came back at that time that's what he is referring egyptians some of them came back to their own land to build it up but everybody were under cyrus at that time he was ruling but he allowed the local generation to go and build okay so so if you look at verse 12 let's read verse 12 now I will make the land of Egypt desolation, midst of desolate land, and the cities in the midst of cities laid waste will dis- desolate forty years. I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations. It happened. They went around just like Israelites. They went to many other nations, nearby nations. So Egypt is an African country, you know that, and Mediterranean uh, Sea is there. You cross the Mediterranean Sea, you come to Europe. If you go to the um, western side, it's all African nations there. they were scattered all around and dispersed to different lands it happened let's move on to verse 30 for oh, that says the lord at the end of 40 years i will gather the israel only egyptians at this promise apart from israelites i will gather them back from the peoples among whom they were god did it Cyrus when he said go back the Egyptians returned back to their own land not all some of them some of the Egyptians were just mingled with other people let's move on to next verse verse 14 i will turn the fortunes of egypt make them return to the land of patros that is the land of egypt to the land of the origin there they will be a lowly kingdom amazing when nebuchadnezzar conquered egypt the glory authority power of pharaoh tumbled down from that time centuries and centuries past even today egypt is a lowly kingdom why god said it god did it that's it we need to understand when god pronounces something it happens let's move on to verse 15 it will be the lowest of the kingdoms 
it will never again lift itself up above the nations. I will make them so small, they will not rule over the nation. We need to understand the Egyptian kingdom and the pyramids they built and the pharaohs, they had the power and authority. When it sinks into us, then we will understand verse 15. Tremendous words. You can never come to that level. You will be the lowest of the kingdoms. You will not rule over any other nations. Have you noticed that? They are not able to. They can't rule anybody now today. They have no authority. I mean, they don't have the power, economic power or I mean, political power to do that. That's what happened to Egypt. Let's move on to verse 16. It will never again be the confidence of the house of Israel. Bang. Israelites sought their help. They will never again seek their help. They will not be the confidence of the house of Israel. Bringing to mind the iniquity of their having turned to Egypt, then they will know I am the Lord. Now, something we need to understand about Egypt. Keep in mind. Today, Israel and Egypt has a peace treaty. Have you noticed that? Number one. Second, if you see the end times, Gog and Magog, Libya, Turkey, all are involved. Look for Egypt. You won't find the name Egypt there. Amazing. Egyptians enslaved the Israelites. They were a mighty kingdom. They came down. But, but, they are not in that end time group which is going against Israel where Christ himself will come and fight. And that is very true. Being an Islamic country, they already signed a peace treaty with Israel. Think of it. God said it many years back. This is going to happen. And these are all things that are happening. Amazing, you know, when we sit in 2024, to look at how people like Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah prophesied, and some of the prophecies we are seeing in our own times, some of the Ezekiel prophecy, we, we will see it in the future. Our future generation will be seeing it. We will be studying that also. So, that's what we are looking at in verse, this verse. Let's move on to the next verse. Verse 17. Now, in the 27th year, ah, wait a minute, pass for a minute. You remember, this is 27th year. Verse 1 is, which year? 10th year. How many years have passed? 17 years have passed between verse 1 and verse 17. There are two different prophecies. Verse 1 to verse 16 is happened in the 10th year. Verse 17 to verse 21 happens in the 27th year. God is speaking to Ezekiel at different times and Ezekiel is noting down the dates. Now, if we come from chapter 1, if you note the dates in which God speaks, Ezekiel is not combining his prophetical book in a sequence according to the dates. No, he didn't do that. He didn't do that. How he has done it is this. He takes topic by topic. Okay, he told me about Israel, he'll combine all of them. Told me about... Um, uh, tired, I'll combine all of them. So some of the prophecies which are told later were written in the initial books and some of them told earlier were written this way. So he has made it so convenient for us, the readers, that when he talks about Egypt, we'll talk all the Egyptian prophecies together. That is why in chapter 29, two prophecies are combined together because this is for Egypt. So we need to understand that. So it's not sequence. But there is 17 years of past. After 17 years, God is again talking about Egypt. Let's move on to chapter 17. Now in the 27th year, in the first month, on the first uh, day, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel. Verse 18, please. Son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, made his armor, army labor hard against Tyre. Every head was made bald, every shoulder was rubbed bare, but he and his army had no wages from Tyre for the labor that he had performed against it. Very interesting thought. Very interesting thought. We need to understand. Nebuchadnezzar, you know, God was dealing with him. You remember that Nebuchadnezzar? The God made him as something like a, uh, not human being, like animal he was there. Then he comes back. 
he acknowledges the mighty god living god is there one god all these things we have seen about it in uh, we read that in daniel this nebuchadnezzar what god says is i sent him to destroy tyre we have already seen the tyre and everything we have already studied that you know the word against tyre the about the kingdom of tyre we have uh, we have seen it in 26 27 28 chapters we studied all these things god used babylon king nebuchadnezzar to fight against tyre so what does god say that about that when nebuchadnezzar did that what is he got telling about nebuchadnezzar let's go to the next verse 19 therefore this says the lord behold i will give the land of egypt to nebuchadnezzar king of babylon he will carry off her wealth capture her spoil seize her plunder it will be wages for his army what happened is you do you recollect tyre was in two places one on the coastal town one on the um, you know the your um, island the tire took all their wealth to the island so nebuchadnezzar although he destroyed the coastal town could not get the wealth it is alexander the great the greek king came and destroyed the other one also so god says look he went then he did not get his wages for the job he did for me so i'm going to give egypt as a wage that's what he says he will come against egypt he is going to get the wealth of egypt remember the wealth of egypt pharaoh so gathered that is all went to babylon nebuchadnezzar let's move on please next verse i have given him the land of egypt for his labor which he performed because they acted for me declares the lord amazing he when a heathen kingdom and he works god repays him your labor is not vain in the lord remember paul says in galatians chapter 6 your labor is not vain in the lord labor for the lord he will give you what you want and again there's a verse paul says in ephesians a wonderful verse you know sometimes we go to a job and we feel i'm doing a wonderful job they are not paying me well you know what he says that job whatever job you do do it unto the lord the lord will pay back once even if you don't get the salary he will pay back believe in that we are children of god we need to believe that so he pays to nebuchadnezzar he has said look i have done it already Read Ezekiel. I give to Nebuchadnezzar all the wealth of Egypt for the job he did for me, fighting against Tyre. Who want to verse twenty-one, please? On that day, I will make a horn sprout out of the for the house of Israel. I will open your mouth in their midst. Then they will know I am the Lord. On that day, that means when these prophecies come to pass, Israel. will spring up israel will then know that what i spoken through ezekiel has happened that their god the god of abraham is a living god they should know i am the lord so this prophecy and working on egypt the kingdom which enslaved israelites god is telling i am bringing my judgment he is telling his own people israel look towards the egypt from which you came out of slaves under the hand of moses or later on through joshua you have all forgotten that the wonderful ministry i have done now you look back and see and you will see when you see that you will understand i am your god and you my people should now spring forth and come up God gave a promise to Israelites, even through the judgment upon Egypt. We are going to stop at this point. We have studied chapter twenty-nine. In fact, we have been studying the judgment of God upon various countries. We have been looking at it already: Moab, Edom, Tyre, Sidon, and today Egypt. And next chapter also continues on Egypt. We will do that, God willing, next week. now as we stop feel free to give your point of view what we have studied in ezekiel feel free to share your thoughts good to know your mind and if you got any queries questions feel free to ask a few minutes before you go for the prayer time is open for all of you